Hi everybody and welcome. I'm thrilled that you took the time to be here. I will do my very best to make it completely worth your while. I started studying men in 1991 and I started with the question, what if men are responding to women, right? And I was looking to see what is it that we as women were doing that was bringing out the worst in men. And lo and behold, guess what one of the things is that brings out the worst in men? Yeah, criticism. Criticism is one of the things that brings out the worst in men, but not always. Aren't those the things that really fake us out? The things that sometimes work or occasionally work, but the rest of the time they don't? And especially if you don't know what to do instead. Right? If you don't know what to do instead, so you keep trying that thing that only works every once in a while. And that's often the case with criticism. So we're going to talk about why criticism doesn't work, why it doesn't work with men. And for those of you who are female, you already know, criticism doesn't work with women. And this is one of the questions that I've gotten for years in our Understanding Women course. And it's co-ed and the men and women are there together and trying to unlock this mystery of who women are and why women do what they do when they do it. And invariably, the men ask, so can you please tell me a way to criticize a woman that will work? Well, if you're a woman, you might already know the answer. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a way to criticize a woman that works. And guys, you think you're really good at taking criticism. E under a very certain set of circumstances. So criticism doesn't work with men. Criticism doesn't work with women. Yet we're compelled to do it anyway. And yes, because we don't have anything else. We don't have anything else for what? So... If you're not familiar with my work, I have been studying men since 1991. And by inference, I ended up studying women. I never intended to. I wasn't struggling with women in any way that I was aware of. <laughs> I found out later, I actually really was. Um, so I ended up studying men. And then every time I'd learn something new about men, I'd be like, why didn't I see that before? Oh, because women do it like this. So over these last 26 years, we have amassed a huge amount of information. And until a year ago, this was always provided to the public through live workshops and through the books that I've written and the many articles that I've written. And as you might know, a plethora of interviews. I'm always trying to get the word out. So I'm interviewed and interviewed and part of this summit and that summit and on the radio regularly and I just do everything I can to let people know really the good news. Because when I started studying men, I thought men were jerks. Now, if you were in a workshop with me, I'd use the word that I really thought, which is much worse. But for the purposes of this, I'm going to say I thought men were jerks. And I questioned whether or not they had souls. And I'm not exaggerating. And I thought that the behavior that I observed was just who men really are. And I was in despair because I was divorced. I had a child. I really wanted to have a family. I really wanted that picture, do you know? And more than the fairy tale, I wanted a partnership. I thought partnership was possible. And even though it didn't show up in my first marriage, I still hungered for it. And it, it turns out it's one of my highest values, which I couldn't have articulated at the time. To me, partnership is what I would call heaven on earth. And it's something I'm passionate about. So when I started studying men, it wasn't with any great commitment. It was just, you know, take a couple months, find out what I can find out about these people, right? Maybe if I could find out how I was bringing out the worst in them, I could stop doing it. And maybe I'd find out a couple things that would bring out the best in them. And 
honestly, my attitude really was like that. I wanted to know how to manipulate them better. Truly. So um, now I have fun teaching people how to notice how they manipulate people and how much it doesn't work because it's so short term. And criticism is one of those things. But again, we haven't been given an alternative. So I'm going to start with talking about why we criticize. So what I mean by that is we don't just do it like for the fun of it. We do it because we have a purpose. We do it because we're trying to accomplish something. And that might be the place to start, right? What is it that we're really trying to accomplish with criticism? And that is why we do it anyway. Even though it usually doesn't work, rarely does work, even more rarely works really well, what is it that we're after that we're compelled to do it because it's often the best thing we've got? So we're going to look actually at four different things. So I'm going to propose that there are four main reasons why men and women criticize. And I'm going to talk about that first. I'm going to do this in the opposite order of our title, why criticism doesn't work and why we do it anyway. I'm going to talk about why we do it anyway, and then I'm going to get more explicit about why it doesn't work. Now, as I've been preparing for this webinar, um, the truth is I have volumes, volumes and volumes of information, not just about criticism, but what works better than criticism. But I can't provide it all in this format or in this context because so much of what drives us to criticize each other is also at the heart of why we struggle so much in our relationships between men and women. So I have hours and hours and hours of information to drill down into the source of that and uproot it. So I can't give you everything, but I want to get you started because, because my work attracts really intelligent people. And it's one of the things that I love about doing this. So I think if you can start to see what you're trying to accomplish with your criticism, even if you decide not to take advantage of our education, you can start experimenting with, is there a better way to accomplish that result without all the consequences that criticism has. So I want to get you down the road and often just seeing why we do it and how much it costs us can open up a whole world. And even if all it does is has you be curious, it's one of my favorite qualities and one that has such a big payoff. If you could just be curious, is there a better way to accomplish this? Is there a better way to have this happen? And oh my gosh, what if you even interacted about it? What if those of you who are here as a couple, those of you who are here in relationship, whether it's a romantic relationship or a family, for example, what if you just got curious and started talking to each other about, okay, this is what I'm trying to accomplish. Is there a better way we could do this? So whether you come to me and to PAX to find out all the better ways we've discovered, or you start working on it on your own, your life is going to be better. And if your life's better, then what I'm committed to in the world is that much further along. All right, everybody take a deep breath. And the first thing that I'd like you to notice is how much energy you have around this topic of criticism. And what I mean by energy is how much does it upset you? How much does it hurt you? How much are you angry or frustrated with criticism that comes at you or criticism that you're generating that ought to work? Just, just notice, just notice the, right, or the, 
right? How many times have your feelings been hurt by criticism? How many times have you as a man been crushed? That's the word that you guys use, that you were crushed by that criticism. We're going to talk about all that, but I just want you to notice that I'm not speaking onto a blank canvas. There's a lot over there. And there's a lot of pain associated with criticism. Whether the criticism began when we were children by these big, big, big people, these big people that we depended upon for everything, or as we were adults and the criticism came from the boys or girls that we wanted to have like us, or the criticism came from an employer when we were just trying to figure out what they wanted and giving them our best. Like, we're trying to do a good job, and all we heard about was what we were doing wrong, but they never told us how to do it right. So whatever your past is with criticism, having received it, I just want to start with I'm sorry. I'm sorry that Literally, as a species, we haven't come up with a better alternative. Well, at least until now. Um, and maybe individuals, there are some individuals in our history that somehow they could communicate with us without a hint of criticism, and they were like magic. I, I hope you've encountered that. He didn't encounter a lot of that. Um, except for maybe the woman who saved my life all those years ago when everything I had learned about men I was using to diminish men without knowing it. And she brought it to my attention. And there, it actually wasn't a criticism. It was a kindness. So, so yeah, I have experienced it in a time that was super important. So please just notice what's already there because everything I say is going to be filtered through it. You, we can't help that as human beings. It's going to be filtered through your past experience. And I'm sorry for all the times that you have been hurt by criticism, diminished by criticism, crushed by criticism, completely thrown off balance or off your game by an unexpected or shocking criticism. I'm sorry for all the moments. <laughs> All the moments that were great, they were awesome, it was wonderful. And then some little thing that was said that just ruined everything. I'm so sorry for that. So let's look at what are we after? What have we been after with other people as we were criticizing them? And what have they been up to with us? And one of the advantages of looking at this is not only if you can see what you're after by criticizing, you may be able to come up with a better way to do it or learn from us all the ways we've learned to avoid it and still get what we need with a lot less effort. Or on the other hand, you may be able to be less affected by another person criticizing you. If you can discern as these words are coming at you that might completely take you out, if you can discern, okay, what are they working on here, right? Where is this coming from? What is this about? If you can see why it's coming at you, then you can be more effective in responding to it and handling it, even diffusing it. So there's a whole lot of merit in getting to the bottom of things. And that's one of my passions, right? Kind of as an engineer, I'm not done till I've taken it all apart and seen why it works that way. And could we put it together differently? Could we come up with a different design that would produce a better result? And that's really the nature of, of what I've been doing all these years. Okay, so let's dive into here. Like I said, we have four different areas. And um, what's interesting about this is I've studied men and women for so long, and I've been able to distinguish, I have never tried to number them. I mean, there's 26 different, different, there's 26 differences 
in the book Keys to the Kingdom alone, many of them hidden. I'm speaking about them, but I don't have them jump out at you. Um, but they're there if someone wants to pick up on them. Um, so I don't even know how many we've cataloged over the years. There's so many of them. And there also are simi similarities. And that to me is as important that we notice the ways that we're the same as we notice that we're different. Because the ways that we're the same, we have human characteristics. And that's one of the things that we don't often want to own, that we're human beings. And there's so much of what we do because we're human. And that may be the first thing that helps you. What if your compulsion to criticize and other people's compulsion to criticize you isn't actually personal? What if it's not because of your ethnicity or your upbringing or your how your parents related to each other or the lack of your parents or the fact that you're firstborn or lastborn or what your sun sign is or what happened in your marriage or any trauma or heartbreak that you've had? What if the compulsion to criticize doesn't originate there? It may have gotten nurtured there, but what if it didn't originate there? What if it's human? So I want to start with ways that men and women are compelled to criticize, what we're up to, right, in our criticism. And then along the ways, I will differentiate some things that I've observed in studying men and women for so long. Okay, so let's talk about the main one, the most obvious one, okay? What we're up to with criticism. One way to say it, the most simplest way to say it is we're trying to change something. Okay, we're trying to change a behavior. We're trying to change the way that somebody is being, right? The, the qualities of their being or their attitude. Or we're trying to get a result, right? We're trying to change the result that we have. Usually by changing someone's behavior or changing some way that they're being, some quality that they're being, or not being. Why can't you be more, right? Why can't you be more blank? Why can't you be more patient? Why can't you be more generous? Why can't you be more supportive? Why can't you be more cooperative? Does this sound familiar? So why can't you? Why aren't you? Why don't you? That's actually a common way to express criticism. It's a common way to express criticism. And it's more common in most women than it is in most men. So absolutes aren't going to get us anywhere. So most women, <laughs> most women criticize through the why don't you, why haven't you, why aren't you, why won't you. That's how we express our criticism. Why haven't you done that yet? Right? So we express criticism that way in order to get something done. Right? Why haven't you done that? Why aren't you doing that? The intent of that expression is for somebody to get moving. Get on it. Makes sense. Makes sense to most women most of the time. And one of the reasons that it makes sense is because it will work. But it'll only work on somebody in particular incidences. It will work on someone who cares about pleasing you. And cares about avoiding displeasing you. So if you say, why don't you, why aren't you, why haven't you? Someone who's worried about pleasing you and avoiding displeasing you will jump up and get to work on that. It doesn't mean that they'll do it with enthusiasm. It doesn't mean they'll do it with love. 
It doesn't mean that they'll do it out of generosity and be cheerful about it which is something that we'll also criticize. You have a terrible attitude. Why do you have such a terrible attitude? Is any of this sounding familiar? So one, it will work on somebody who cares about pleasing you. <laughs> which the people who care the most about pleasing you, which may sound good, it's not. It's a very low level. Pleasing you and avoiding displeasing you, staying in your good graces, staying out of trouble, that's a very low level of relating. You have to distinguish pleasing you from pleasure, right? One of the favorite things of men in being intimate is to provide pleasure. And they'll usually say, I just want to please you. No, that's the please pleasure kind. Be careful not to confuse those. Please you like stay in your good graces, stay out of trouble. The people who are going to relate to you that way and jump up and do that thing, the first thing is that they're going to have to feel dependent upon you in some way. They have to care about not being in trouble with you. So people you're paying who need the money to pay their rent, more likely to jump up off their seat to do something. People who are in relationship with you, in romantic relationship, who, who feel like they got to stay in your good graces or you're not going to provide for them what they need you to provide, they'll jump up that way. Now, there's another caveat, right? And that is besides someone who cares about pleasing you, staying out of trouble with you, the person who's going to respond to, why don't you, right? Why don't you? Why haven't you? Why aren't you? Also has to be literal. Actually, they have to be not literal. They, they have to be not literal. They said it backwards. They have to care about pleasing you and avoiding displeasing you and they have to not listen literally. So this is one of the reasons why criticism doesn't work, even though we're compelled to do it. We're compelled to do it to cause a change. Most women most of the time do it in the why don't you, why haven't you, why aren't you. Most men most of the time are not literal. No. Why do I keep saying that backwards? I don't know. I'm criticizing myself now. Most, isn't that funny? It's a human trait. Most men, most of the time, are literal. Which means, this is why you get the thing you're not looking for. They say, why, you say, why haven't you unloaded the dishwasher yet? And he pauses. He hasn't jumped up to do it. He pauses some more. He still hasn't gotten up to do it. And then he answers your question. So you say, why haven't you? He's thinking about, hmm, why haven't I? And then he tells you why he hasn't. You did not want the reason why he hasn't. You wanted him to get up and get on it. So amongst women, the why haven't you, why aren't you, why don't you, that communicates to most women most of the time because we are not literal. To most men, most of the time, they'll answer your question. And that's usually infuriating. Are you starting to see it? So that form of criticism, not so effective. And the people it is effective on we actually lose respect for them. So if we had any in the beginning, people we would talk to like that, them being motivated by that kind of communication doesn't gain any respect. It actually loses more respect and more admiration. It loses it. 
So very effective and costly in many ways. Okay, so we think that by expressing our displeasure at something, that that will cause somebody to fix it. And a common expression of this again, especially amongst women, is if we can let someone know how upset we are about it. I can't believe you haven't done that yet. Do you know how mad that makes me? Um, yeah, I think so. Again, a literal response when what we wanted was action. So, again, only someone who wants to stay out of trouble with you is going to be motivated by knowing how upset something makes you. We often, as human beings, try to motivate people through that emotion. That if we're just upset enough or angry enough or hurt enough, I'm so hurt. I can't believe you haven't unloaded the dishwasher yet. How many times do I have to ask you? Yeah, we can have that kind of expression of criticism. We think that that will have them do it. If they really care about us. But I want you to notice on your side, when somebody does that to you, if it gets you to act, it's very temporary. It's not sustainable and it's not going to bring out your best. You're not going to do your best at that. You're going to end up with the bare minimum to, to sneak by that minefield. You're not going to be creative. You're not going to invent a new, better way to do it. You're not going to systematize it so they never have to worry about it again. Those are behaviors that come from a different kind of communication partnership communication. All right, can you see that I could just keep going on this for so long? It's fascinating to me. And I'm going to keep my promise here. So in this first way, right, we're trying to change behavior. We think by expressing displeasure about something that's happening or not happening or a way that a person is being, that we want them to fix how they're being. Being is something people choose. It's a beautiful thing. Or it's something that's inspired, another beautiful thing. Um, neither, which, neither of them come from criticism. Um, preferences, we're gonna talk about preferences. Because we often criticize when something isn't preferred. Why did you put that there? Right? So nothing bad happened that they put that there. But we like it put someplace else. So again, preferences have to do with being pleasing. Okay? And we're also expressing anger. Right? Again, like I said, that the emotion will cause a change in someone's behavior. And sometimes, sometimes our criticism is accusing. If you really loved me, you would have already done that. So our criticism is accusing them of not relating to us in the way that we think if they related to us that way, they would have done it right. Okay? And then sometimes, again, for this purpose of changing behavior, there's some punishment in there. There's some poking. There might be a knife in there. There's our criticism not only has the intention to change them, but it has the intention to hurt them. It's a kind of punishment. And it gets all messed up when it's like that. Right? Because already criticism rarely works to change behavior, almost never works to change a way of being. And then when it's used to punish someone, oh boy, oh boy. 
Maybe there's no accident. I'm not, I'm saying, oh boy. Um, Cause this happens a lot too often. And especially, especially generated in this case, especially generated from women to men. And that may upset you that like I'm taking this out on women. No, I really want to empower you to get everything that you need from all the men in your life. And punishing them for not already giving it to us never, ever works. And it causes one of the things that we put in the email. It causes a man to withdraw. It causes him to withdraw emotionally. It can cause him to withdraw sexually, cause him to withdraw mentally, like literally not think about us as often as we want. And it can cause him to withdraw physically. And all of those, of course, would include communication. Communication is mental and emotional and physical and a, and a big part of sexuality. So when criticism includes this trying to change you and punish you for not already doing it right, then we're talking way down into the toilet fast. And one of the things I would invite you to look at if you tend to do this is that that punishment comes from it comes from the pain we experience by thinking that they're doing it wrong on purpose because they don't really care about us and don't really love us or don't really respect us. What if that isn't the reason? What if that isn't the reason in the beginning? All the things that people don't do right when they are in love with us. What if that isn't the reason? What if it can end up becoming the reason because we kill the love, we kill the care, we kill the respect through our criticism? So you, it could get there. You could get it there. But what if it didn't start there? We just assumed they didn't do everything right our way before we ever asked, for not because they didn't care. Maybe a different reason, a valid reason. All right, we're going to keep going. One of the reasons that I say see that we criticize, so this is sort of 1.5, is that even if it's too late for them to change their behavior, like the moment's passed, you blew it. We're in so much frustration and anger and maybe also hurt that even if it's too late to change their behavior, we're hoping it's going to make us feel better if we can express how upset we were. If we could just say how awful it was that they didn't do it right, maybe we'd feel better. It actually doesn't make us feel better. <laughs> you might notice it doesn't make us feel better to, to say all that. You might notice the thing that makes us feel better is when they're sorry. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get your birthday right. Oh, oh, and that's a kind of behavior. We're trying to cause someone to apologize because the apology actually has a miraculous effect on what hurts. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get Valentine's Day right. I'm sorry I didn't pull off the anniversary that I wanted to pull off for you. And I'm sorry that had you feel like I don't love being married to you. I'm sorry for that. Oh. Oh. So often the behavior that we're trying to get is to have ourselves be restored. And that if we just get to express how messed up we are, how disappointed, how frustrated, how hurt we are, if we express it in this way, I can't believe you didn't, and I can't believe you did, 
that then will be restored. So this is one of the things that if you got curious about, okay, if criticism doesn't have someone apologize, it may have them do their, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry routine. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But that's not the kind I'm talking about. That doesn't actually heal anything. Them whimpering like a kicked dog doesn't actually restore us. What restores us is a, an apology, a true, authentic, I'm sorry with dignity. And I'm sorry from someone we admire which means we can't have beat them down too much. Can't beat them into an apology because we need an apology by someone who isn't beaten. This beats it. This brings us to the next thing that we may be up to with criticism. Again, that doesn't really work. And that is that we often criticize both men and women as a defense to criticism. So when somebody's coming at us with all this criticism, with or without emotion, and why don't you, and I can't believe that you didn't, and even like it's too late, it's too late, you totally blew it, right? So all the ways that people come at us with criticism leads to the second reason that we criticize, and that's we criticize in defense. So we have all this coming at us. We'll often criticize, we'll come, well, why don't you ever do the dishes? Why don't you ever do more? Why don't you ever appreciate everything I already did? Why don't, right? Why don't, why haven't? So we criticize in defense. We criticize to try to get that person to stop criticizing us. And, it, and then people just magically stop being so awful with each other. Just you criticize them and they criticize you and then ha, everybody just like remembers who they are and, and laughs and is back in love. No, 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 no. Criticism begets criticism. I can't believe after what you said to me that you did that. That doesn't work either. Now, there's another, there's another reason that we criticize. And this is fascinating to me. And often we don't, when we do this one, it seems to make sense at the time, and we're oblivious. Both men and women were oblivious to how much it doesn't work and never will work, and causes such an extraordinary amount of damage to the foundation of how we're relating to each other. Like, it undercuts our relationships it, oftentimes in a way that can never be restored. And that is when we criticize in order to get what we need by attacking and, and that is the way that it's perceived, and that is the energy around it, by attacking what we see is in front of us in line. So I'm going to switch this around a bit. I, I try to be fair if I can. This is a reason that most men will criticize most of the time. So while a woman will tend to criticize in order to change a behavior or a way of being, a man will tend to criticize in order to change 
the priority. In order to advance their place in line, in line, they see themselves as in a line, waiting behind. So when a man needs something from you, whether you're his mom or his sister or his employee or his lover or his girlfriend or his wife of 30 years, when he needs something from a woman and he can't get it because her time and her energy and her attention and Maybe your money is going to something else. So he will attack what he sees as coming before him, what he sees as taking what he needs, that she's giving to them what he needs. She's giving to it to it. Now, women will do this as well. We, we, we do this. It's not as common, but we do do it. Like, well, the reason why he isn't paying attention to me is because he's so wrapped up in his job and he thinks his job is so important and he just loves that job. So, well, that's a stupid job. I can't believe all the time you spent at that you spent at that stupid job. It doesn't even pay you that much. The truth is we we often don't mind the job's fine. Right? We love that there are children that she's paying attention to. But the we call it human animal. The instinctive compulsive response is you're spoiling that kid. So there'll be a criticism. Why do you spoil him? There'll be a criticism of the behavior related to somebody else. Well, you just totally indulge those kids. Or I can't believe how much you let your brother manipulate you. you he's got you wrapped around his finger. So, so more men, but women too. Women because it's not that we care about that thing. We, we think that that thing is the reason we're not getting what we need. So both men and women will attack what you we see as ahead of us in line. And why it's so devastating to the foundation of a relationship is because there's a reason. There's a good reason why. There's a good reason why someone spends their time and their energy and their money and their attention and maybe their heart on that thing. Every one of us, every one of us, what we spend ourselves on is a reflection of our core, a reflection of our highest values, a reflection of what we think matters, what we think is the most important. Now, is every action a reflection of this? No. In understanding women, one of the most important things that we teach men and women are the things that will actually eclipse a woman's choosing, that she's so compelled by instinct, she's not choosing to spend her energy there, her time, her attention. She wasn't saying that thing was more important than you. It's by virtue of the way that estrogen has her brain works that she got distracted by that. And if you can understand what distracts her and that she didn't actually say that was more important than you, her brain got pulled away, not her heart, not her choices, not her commitment. If you can understand that, then you can interact with her more effectively in a way that actually would get you what you needed. We're honestly criticizing her. I can't believe you're paying attention to that. I can't believe you care about that. I mean, when you criticize a woman, there goes her fairy dust. There goes her magic. There goes her life force. 
what men want most from women. You want our attention so that our life force is flowing towards you, our, our radiance, our smile, the sparkle of our eyes, our love, our admiration. You want it flowing towards you because that's what energizes you to go produce all those results. And when you criticize us, we might be paying you attention. We're just going to try to stay out of trouble with you because you're so much bigger and stronger. But our life force just... Gone. Drained out of us. We might do the thing that you said. We'll hustle and get the kids in the car and then quick grab you some food or whatever it is, the sales report, the whatever the context is. We may hustle along and try to please you, but the thing you really needed as a man, our life force, our brilliance, our wonder, our spirits, you just killed it. Can't believe you're doing some, something so stupid. I was in the middle of talking to you and you're straightening the pillow. Yeah, I was listening. The, the pillow was talking to me too. It, it just it, it it just straightened the pillow so it would shut up so I could hear you better. Women now are going, how does she know the pillow's talking to me? Because I'm a woman. Because I've been studying us for all these years. It's one of the biggest things that men don't know about us or how much our environments talk to us. They think we're choosing all the time to pay attention to those things instead of them. They don't know there's no choice involved. Just as you probably don't know there's no choice in what he's reacting to when he perceives a threat to your to you and your family's safety and, and he vetoes something. No, we can't go on a vacation like that. But I, it's my dream. Uh, you don't know. You don't know because he doesn't say. We can't do it now because we got to send this child to college and we have to save enough for retirement so that when we retire, we can be comfortable and I can take you to all the countries you've been telling me about for the last 30 years. He doesn't say all that. He just says, no. And that also feels like a criticism. Shot you down. I have to tell you, I had this very linear plan of how I was going to teach you this. I had it all lined out. We're going to talk about this, and then we're going to talk about this. And it's not turning out that way. And the biggest reason is, ouch. Ouch. Ouch for men. Ouch for women. Ouch for how we take each other apart. And I think we honestly don't really mean to take each other apart. We're just so frustrated. We're just so hurt. We just need so much. And, and it starts with human instincts. Tell us to never even admit that. That's a, that would be a weakness for a man to say to his wife, but I need your attention. I, I need you to listen to me. I need you to talk to me. I, I need you to touch me. If you knew the victory of human spirit it would take for a man to say that, how every cell in his body is telling him to never admit that, and that's why instead he just attacks what's in front of him in line instead of, it's really a problem for me that I'm third in line because I need from you what I can't get from anybody else. I, I don't have another place I can go to for this. You're it. You're my only store. And I'm fourth in line. And by the time I get to the front of the line, you're usually out of milk. Men, every instinct in them as a warrior as a protector, as a provider, as a warrior, as a hunter, tells them to never tell you that. So he attacks the thing in front of him. He criticizes you paying attention to that.
Yeah. So what men and women both do, and men tend to do it more. <clears throat> women tend to first go the route of, we have an issue. And we'll get around to attacking the thing that's in front of us, getting what we need. You just spend too much time taking care of your mother. Wow, how devoted you are to your family is one of the things that had me marry you. But I need something I'm not getting, and she's in front of me in line. Okay, I think I've said enough on that example. There's actually something that isn't criticism that is perceived as criticism. And it can be hurtful. which is sad that it's hurtful because it wasn't ever meant to hurt. So what I'm talking about is that we're, we're both so wanting to be perfect for the other person and we've been so sensitized by being criticized for all these different reasons that we hear and feel criticism in a simple statement of fact. It feels like criticism. So someone makes a meal. This often happens with women. We're so sensitive to this. We make a meal for a man and he says, the steak is dry. It's just a statement of fact. The steak is dry. <gasps> the steak is dry. The green beans are salty. Oh, I wanted a blue one, not a green one. So men and women will just state facts. Oh, I was hoping for a blue one. And then he's bummed. Because he, he went all the way to the store to get you whatever it was, a vase, a dish towel, and he missed that detail. That, that, that didn't seem important. The dish towel seemed important. You, he could see your need for that dish towel. I know I'm giving a lot of domestic risk examples, but it applies everywhere. He can see that you needed a desk. He can see that you needed a pen, that you needed a sales report, that you needed that. That thing makes sense. That detail of the font you wanted the report in, the color you wanted the dish towel, that didn't register. Why? Because his brain works differently. And if you can understand, there's a very good reason for his brain working like that then it doesn't have to hurt your feelings. It's the wrong color or the wrong font or he got it to you, but it was a half hour later and you, you needed it a half hour earlier, but he missed that part. If you understand what has men miss details, then you actually can communicate better and get more of what you need. But meanwhile, statements of facts end up hurting people because we're so sensitized we're not desensitized. Getting criticized a lot doesn't make us less sensitive to it. The only thing that makes us less sensitive to criticism is when we don't care about somebody. I don't care about you. If I don't care about you, I don't care about your criticism. That's the only thing that makes both men and women less sensitive. We don't care. I don't respect you. I don't admire you. I don't love you. I don't care about you. So until we have no regard for each other whatsoever, criticism is never going to work. It's always going to hurt. It's always going to cause a loss of confidence, a loss of intimacy, a loss of receptivity, a loss of passion, a loss of life force, a loss of generosity, a loss of devotion, a loss of wholeheartedness. In men and women, 
It's going to cause that. It just is. It just doesn't work. Are you getting curious about what does? Our human instincts produce criticism, and I'm going to tell you why, okay? Human instincts are all about survival. Just like every other species, it's about survival. And in order to survive, we're protecting ourselves. Yes, we protect others, but first we protect ourselves. And how come criticism is the go-to way of communicating? from instinct is because we remain invulnerable. It's like, it's like shooting arrows from a castle turret. We're invulnerable. You can't get to me, but I can get to you. It's like shooting from behind a door. It's like poisoning somebody's drink when they're not looking. Criticism keeps us safe while communicating, we want something to be different. That's why we're compelled to do it. All of the ways that we do it, we're compelled because it seems to keep us safe. While expressing all the things we need to express. But it destroys our relationships of all kinds. All kinds. And it doesn't get us more of what we need in any sustainable way. Because the things that get us more of what we need in a sustainable way don't come from human instinct. They come from what we refer to as human spirit. They're conscious, educated choices that are taking risks, that are reaching towards a person reaching towards them, not throwing something at them. And that's what my work has been about for all these years, to find out what has us do what we do and misunderstand and misinterpret each other and end up just with all our relationships in a toilet versus what if we understood something better and we're more curious about who people really are what are the things we could choose instead that would get us, as men and women, more of what we need? With less effort because we're working with the instincts. There's not a fundamental flaw in the instincts. We're both compelled to create and to protect and to provide. We both have these compulsions. Those could actually be harnessed with some really, really beautiful choices to make everybody's lives better instead of everybody's lives harder. How do I interest my wife in the entire PACS curriculum? Um, it's a beautiful question, and, and really the answer is to begin. So if you begin with understanding men and understanding women, then we have a special package for you to go forward where you would receive understanding men, sex, and intimacy, understanding men, love, and commitment. Ah, being an extraordinary woman which is all about what brings out the best in her. And then you also get a bonus of um, our newest course called Extreme Freedom. So if you start with this package, we have a package for you to continue on with the entire online curriculum at an extremely reasonable rate. I mean, it ends up being about half the price of what it would be to buy those things separately. And the way to get interested is to begin. And it often works in reverse. As a man, if you start on understanding her and she sees your commitment to understanding her, 
which is shocking to women. <laughs> they think, well, we're the ones that work on relationships all the time. When she sees you working on a relationship in a way that connects with her, that's often one of the most in, enrolling things to do. And also, just every time something makes sense, which is what we specialize in. That's what I do. I have things add up and add up into better results and a lot more happiness. Okay, next question. What is the alternative to criticism? Um, you have only spoken of the disadvantages. Yes, because the alternatives to criticism are many, but they require unhooking from all the things that make you criticize. So, for example, an alternative to criticism is clarity. Most of us are completely confused about what we really need. We're so lost in everything that just should be already. An alternative to criticism is consistency. What, what most women say isn't trusted by men and therefore not acted upon by men because we're terribly inconsistent and we don't even recognize our inconsistencies. But we make ourselves unbelievable to them. So they don't act on what we say. So we think we have to say it mean to get them to act. That doesn't work either. Um, another thing that works that will take such courage to provide is what I call clues. If the men in your life are clueless, well, that means they need m clue more. They need more clues. They, they don't do what you need because you haven't given them enough clues. And criticism is what you would just call a cold clue. In the warmer, colder, hot game, if you played it as a kid, criticism is just a cold clue. It doesn't, it tells you where the cliff is, but it doesn't tell you where the prize is. So those are examples of, of things that we can do instead of criticism. But one of the things that goes with our criticism is quite frankly, our timing sucks. Because so much of the time we're protecting ourselves, we don't communicate even with criticism until we're boiling over, till we're more angry than we are afraid. We're more frustrated than we are afraid. And we do the same thing with most, most of our communication. We, we communicate at the wrong time. We communicate when men can't hear us, literally can't hear us, because of the way that their brains are, are put together. So what works instead of criticism, if, if you're just told to do that, but you don't understand why it matters, and when it matters and how it matters, you're not going to be any more effective. So I can't tell you in a few minutes what to do instead. The, the biggest thing to do instead is find out who these people are. What really motivates men? What really motivates women? So that you can not only be effective in all the ways I have to teach you, you can find your own ways to be effective because you're now dealing with what's actually happening with that other person instead of what we assume is happening with that other person. Women assume men are motivated by the same reasons we are. They're not. They're not. Men assume women are motivated by the same reasons they are. We're not. We don't even talk for the same reasons. Seriously, we don't even use words for the same reason. We're worlds apart. All right, how do you give feedback to teenage boys without criticizing? It's, Angela, it's gonna be the same answer. There's no difference between a, a teenage boy than, I would call him a teenage man. There's no, once they hit puberty, all the things that make him a man are filing. And when they're really tiny, all the things that make him a man are present. Baby boys have as much testosterone as a full-grown man. It's the in-between baby and puberty that you get something hmm, 
less rigid, less, less testosterone-based thinking. So they appear more malleable in that period of time. And then it all blows up when they hit puberty because literally their brains are reconfiguring, their values are shifting dramatically, their orientation is completely changed and we're lost. Which is one of the reasons why you wanna to listen to the amazing development of men because it talks about the difference in focus that kicks in at puberty. So everything that works with a grown man about criticism, which is don't criticize, will apply to a teenager and everything that works that we teach you in understanding men to get more of what you need without criticizing will work with a teenage man. Alicia, what do I do when my husband, we're separated but are living in the same house still, rewrites history to make himself right? In fact, what shall I do? We insist on being right at all costs. You could start with figuring out how you're attacking him. That's why he's defending. Once we stop attacking, it takes a while for them to figure it out, but then they stop defending. It's a big part of where we have to look at understanding men, that how we bring out the worst in men is that we attack them without even realizing we're attacking them. Tam, how do I help him speak to me in a way that I can hear for he criticizes with the intent to make me better, however he is doing that to try to get me to change how I think? Gah, love him and he is amazing and I see him wanting to help and only hindering us. You're going to have to give him the words, Tam, that if you said that to me like this, I could engage, I could, care, I could care. So men respond to what works. I said this before. So you have to give him the words that when he does what those words, it actually works for you. If you give him words that don't work, that's another way you end up not trusted. You're not a trusted source of information if what you say works doesn't work. So you got to think about what would work. How could he accomplish what he's trying to accomplish? He's trying to change how you think. How could he change how you think? Or is there no way to change how you think? This is what I mean by you get curious. Curious between each other. Well, what would work? How could I do that better? Greg and I have been doing this for 25 years, and we still have that curiosity. So how could I have done that better? Hey, was that better than last time? That seemed like that was better than last time. So 25 years of working on this, we still allow for that we don't have it all figured out, and we can make mistakes with each other and forgive each other and keep trying and keep giving each other clues. Warmer, warmer, that was better. Colder, colder, that's, there's a cliff over there, honey. Honey, that was hot. So that's what I would have you start with. What's the best way to respond to criticism from your husband, from your partner or husband? Well, it all depends on what result you want. But I would start with, how about we make a new deal? We're in a bad pattern, a bad human behavior. How about I work on not criticizing you and you work on not criticizing me? And it would help if you notice where it comes from. So was he attacking something that's ahead of him in line? Was he just stating a fact? Was he defending himself? Or is there something he's trying to change? So one of the things you can do when someone criticizes you, if it's the number one reason they're trying to change you, you can actually change, shift it. If you see, oh, they're, they obviously need something different from me, and their only way of going about it, the very human way of going about it, is criticizing what is, or that I haven't done something yet. Okay, let's try something. It seems like you need something from me, and if I were clear about what it was, I would have already done it. So could you take a moment and think about what you really need from me and tell me what it is exactly instead of the way you're communicating now, which it's not going to get any better? 
And you can be kind about it. You can be soft about it. You can be firm about it. In horsemanship, there's a saying from Ray Hunt, as soft as you can and as firm as you need. We advocate that. And we're going to keep advocating honor yourself first. Throughout our curriculum is honor yourself first because nobody else can. And when you sell yourself out, when you sacrifice yourself, it's all over. Partnership's impossible as soon as you sacrifice yourself. So you can respond to someone criticizing you in a whole lot of ways with a whole lot of tones and attitudes and words. But the truth is, is how you respond will never become effective until you commit to not being criticized. When you commit to that, when you, you could say when you take that stand, I don't interact in the world of criticism. I'm unwilling to communicate with that, that way. I'm unwilling to communicate with you that way, and I'm unwilling for you to communicate with me that way. So could you think of a better way to say what you're trying to get from me? Well, but, but, no, actually, I insist. You, you need to come up with another way. Well, that way. Because if you don't come up with a better way, I'm just not going to listen. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to hang up. I'm not going to respond to the email. I insist you come up with a better way of communicating with me. I'm actually not kidding. <laughs> I, I do this. But you have to start with the end. Criticism doesn't work. The end. I'll probably make a mistake and criticize. But I'm committed to not criticizing. And I'm committed to not tolerating being criticized. That's, that's a choice that you can make. Until you commit to it. It's all just kind of fishing. Just kind of fishing, trying, well, let's see what might happen. What if you committed to not accepting criticism, not being willing to be talked to like that? What if you respected you that way? How we respect ourselves is the model for other people. How do I say anything to my wife that won't be interpreted as criticism? Oh, I'm so sorry, Lynn. You may have to apologize for anything you've ever said that she felt criticized in the past and express your commitment to not do that. And you guys may have to make a deal. We, we coach women in in be, it, getting in partnership with men to not emasculate them. And could you please tell me nicely when I've emasculated you so I can break this habit? Well, do you think you could tell me nicely when I've criticized you and I didn't know it? Because I never know it. I don't think I ever criticize you. Could you tell me when you feel criticized so I can become aware of it? And could you do it nicely? You'd have to... You'd have to do a reset, Lynn. Let's do a reset. You know, like a video game? We've fallen off a cliff. Let's do a reset. New game. New game. Zero criticism. Would you work on that with me? I don't criticize you and you don't criticize me. And if you say it feels like criticism, then I'm going to fix it. If I tell you that feels like your criticism, then... I'll tell you how you could say that different. That wouldn't be a criticism. We, this is something we can only do together because I can't fix it on my side and you can't fix it on your side. We got to fix it on both sides at the same time. That's where I would start, Lynn. Okay. Stephanie, do men feel criticized when you give them constructive feedback? Do they know the difference? <laughs> they do know the difference. And I would have to know what you thought the difference was of constructive feedback. And I'll tell you how my husband interprets constructive feedback. If I say, the only thing that would have made that more perfect is, that to him would be constructive feedback. 
So another way of saying it is if you only tell them about all the minus points from 100 and you never tell them about all the plus points that got them to 80 or 90 or 95, that's not constructive feedback. Okay, Heather, what do I do when criticism comes out as a constant complaint about everything, such as the laundry is wrinkled, the coffee pot was left on, complaining about everything loud enough for me to hear the complaint so that maybe I will get sick of the complaining so that I will change? Well, again, Heather, you're going to have to decide when are you going to be done with criticism. It's an instinctive behavior. It's like a dog peeing on a tire. How's that for graphic? So the dog doesn't stop peeing on the tire till you're committed to dogs not peeing on tires. So when you get committed, well, you can see where the metaphor goes. I'm going to not say that because I don't want to be accusing anybody of nothing. But when you get committed to not being interacted with that way, that's going to blow up your status quo and something else will become possible. Do you have the courage to find out what's possible, or are you going to spend a life like this? Because that's the thing as human beings we never want to tell the truth about. The train tracks are headed towards a cliff. When are you going to stop the train? Or are you just going to hope that it magically turns before the cliff? They don't magically turn. Relationships do not magically turn before the cliff. People's behavior doesn't magically turn before a cliff. People's behavior changes because somebody made a choice, a big choice, and then followed it up and followed it up and followed it up. Didn't expect everything to happen magically. So what do you do, Heather? First you decide, are you going to keep living like that? Once you decide you're done, you'll come up with all kinds of things to do, all kinds of things to say. You can walk away. Whenever there's criticism, you just leave the house. Where'd she go? You were complaining again. Why did you leave? I'm not willing to be in the same house with a complainer. What? You do it enough times, they stop complaining. <laughs> There's so many things you can do, but none of them you'll think of until you get committed. Okay, Robert, how can I explain in a way that my partner hears me that to offer to teach me or suggesting to me a way of thinking or doing something without asking me if I want that information causes me to separate from her? Ha! <laughs> yes! Yes! Ah! Yes! Well, maybe you can ever watch this, Robert, that offering to teach you something or suggesting a different way of thinking or doing something has in it, you're not doing it right. And not only that, you're not smart enough to figure out how to do it right. It's an attack. Suggestions, unrequested suggestions, unasked for suggestions, occur as an attack on a person's ability. Their sneaky criticism, suggestions, may I show you something, may I teach you something, that sneaky criticism, sneaky. So if you could tell her that, and, and yes, it causes you to keep your distance. It causes you to distance yourself. That's what criticism does to men. It occurs as an attack, and it causes you to keep your distance. And I'm so sorry. And we think suggestions should be welcomed. But it's baloney. Can I make a suggestion? Because, you know, I'm going to be sneaky about that I really don't like how you're doing that. And so I'm going to try to make a suggestion and make it seem like it's nice. But really, I'm very displeased and I want you to change your behavior, but I'm not going to be straight about it. I'm going to be devious about it. And you're not going to pick up on it. Of course you're going to pick up on it. 
I had to find this out the hard way, Robert. I had to actually ask someone other than my husband. <laughs> so how is it for you to be given a suggestion? <laughs> He was the one who explained to me, and then I got to check out with other men. It's an attack. It's a sneak attack. It's a devious attack. You'd much rather we were direct. It's really driving me crazy how you're doing that. Would you let me tell you why and how and so it could have a different result? So a woman could say that, but only if a man could say no. Oh, okay. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> the way I like to say it, if is a man can't say no, he can't say yes. Same thing for a woman. If you don't get to say no to a suggestion, you don't get to say yes. It has to have true respect in it. Will you name quickly the four reasons people criticize? I tried to take notes, but I lost track of where one stopped and the next started. To change behavior, to defend themselves, to attack something that's standing in front of them in line. And the fourth one, they're not really criticizing, they're just stating a fact, but it's perceived as criticism. Darcy, also wanted to ask about the idea, what if the reason we think someone did something is incorrect? I think this is an interesting idea. It sounds like we have to disbelieve ourselves or distrust our own certainty about being right at times. Is that correct? Well. I don't know if we have to believe, disbelieve ourselves. I think we have to be skeptical about our own filters and our perceptions. And I prefer instead to be curious. What if there's a good reason for that? Wow, okay, that seemed like a jerky thing to do. What if there's a good reason for that? <laughs> Greg says he owes his life to me wondering that. But I've learned almost everything I know from what if no one's misbehaving? What if there's a good reason for that? What if it's not for the reason I think? What if he's responding to me? What if he's not responding to me? Curiosity, curiosity. If I could give you one quality to bring to interact with another human being, it would be curiosity. Interesting curiosity comes from the Latin word that means to care. To care, to care about what's really going on over there. Curiosity. Men driving. Have you dealt with this topic in any of your books? If so, which one? My, men, my son drives way too fast and I feel unsafe. A request for him to slow down makes him mad at me. Um, understanding women. We talk about women's vision and why the way that men drive scares the pucky out of us. It has to do with the way that our eyes are, which has to do with the way that our brains are. So what you're seeing is not the same thing as he's seeing. So in the Understanding Women course is where we talk about that. I don't do it in a book. Reach out, don't attack. Well, Amy, I love your question. You got to notice when you have attack energy. When you're all revved up and, ah, and he's the enemy and I gotta get him. <sighs> stand down, stand down, stand down. <sighs> and you can even confess, I'm not completely clear that I can say this without it being an attack. But I'd like to try. Attacking is all about having your shield up. It's all about being invulnerable. It's all about strategizing, the perfect thing to say, just the way to say it. And <laughs> That's all in an adversarial relationship. That's all human instinct. So you actually have to shift how you relate to other people, which is a huge part of our curriculum. I'm a woman and I and find I withdraw and lose interest when I'm criticized by a man, how do you make a man understand how criticism affects us? You have him do the Understanding Women course where we explain not only how it affects us, but why it affects us that way biologically and brain configuration. We have it make sense to him why criticism will never work.